today we are diving into everything cost segregation with Yaron of Cintiv. Yaron, how are you today? Good. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to have you here. So this is something that is really technical. If you've not already listened to our podcast about tax planning, go back a couple of episodes. I'll link it in the show notes. But for anybody who's already listened to that and they're thinking that you know they want to buy a short-term rental to save money on their tax taxes, a key component of this is a cost segregation study. So maybe you can just kick us off with telling us a little bit about how people are saving money on their taxes by buying short-term rentals and where this study comes into play. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm, as I'm sure a lot of people know, you know, one of the biggest advantages to owning real estate in general is the tax advantages. You kind of get that triple threat, right? You get the appreci- appreciation, the cash flow, and the depreciation. So what we're focusing on is on that depreciation side of things. And basically, um, when you buy a property, uh, you get to depreciate the house and any real property on the property as a business expense. And so the IRS allows you to depreciate that property over a long period of time. Uh, if it's you know a residential building, it's 27 and a half years. If it's commercial, it's over 39 and a half years or 39 years, sorry. Um, and so basically what we're doing is we're uh, allowing you and helping you maximize the benefits of that. How do we do that? So instead of taking uh, a little bit of that depreciation every year over that 39 years, let's say, we take a lot of it up front. So it's kind of the same concept as if I offered you, you know, hey, you can either have uh, $10,000 over, you know, monthly over the next two years versus take $10,000 today, what would you rather? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it would make a lot of sense to get that $10,000 today because then you can use that to reinvest or to, you know, Mm -hmm. buy whatever you need. So Mm -hmm. that's the major thing that we're doing here. Um, We're basically taking that straight line, long-term depreciation, and we're taking it all or as much of it as possible now. And just a real world application and a good way to explain it is, let's say you're making a hundred thousand dollars, uh, in income this year. So in general, you're going to be taxed somewhere between 25 and 35% on that. So let's just say $30,000, uh, by doing a cost segregation study in theory, if it's done properly with the right properties and such, uh, basically, uh, that hundred thousand dollars, you won't get taxed on that at all. That will be non-taxable. And so that thirty thousand dollars that would have gone to the government is going to be able to sit in your pocket and you can use that to reinvest. This is so powerful. And this mm-hmm. is like really life-changing for me when I learned about this. And you know, the crazy thing is, is not every CPA yeah. knows about this. Yeah. I actually find it shocking. You know, I talk to CPAs all the time. A lot of them don't know what this is. My dad's CPA, oh, Jeff. There you go. We're going to send this to her. Okay. Well, absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. We love working with CPAs. And yeah, a lot of CPAs don't know what this is. And even for the most of them that do know what this is, 99% of them don't do this, Uh, mostly because it's very labor intensive and it's very specialized in the tax code. It's not just a general CPA type of practice. It's very specialized. There's not technically a course to learn how to do this. This is something that you learn by working in it. Um, And so our founder, Bobby, uh, Bobby Thames, uh, he learned how to do this with basically the guy that wrote the book on cost segregation. And he used to do this for large organizations. Uh, like when the Atlanta Falcons uh, built the new Mercedes Benz stadium, he did it on that. When Porsche built some new, uh, manufacturing plants here in the U S he did that. So, uh, we really have, uh, you know, the the mother load in terms of experience and wealth of knowledge in this area. Yeah. And this is so huge. So to go back to your yeah. analogy. So let's say that you're a W-2 employee, you're yeah. earning $100,000, your tax liability is going to be somewhere around $30,000 that is just being taken out of your paycheck yeah. every single month. I feel like sometimes people forget about that. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, business owners as well, like you're working really hard on your business. And then all of a sudden you're like, I don't feel like I made that much. Like I did not pocket that much, but I'm paying so much in taxes. Like when I first started, I was like, 
this is crazy. Like I felt like I paid like the majority of my income in taxes before, not the majority, it feels like that, I guess, but sure. it was it's significant. A, it's a chunk. It's it a was chunk. significant. Yeah. And so before learning about this study, mm-hmm. I just, I kept on like hearing like, oh, you know, like so-and-so doesn't pay taxes. Right. Or pays zero in taxes. If you're a real estate investor, you should be able to get your tax liability to zero or really low. And I was like, what is everybody doing that I don't know about? And it's this. It is bonus depreciation. And what you do is you do the study, which is called a cost segregation study. Can you define that for us? Yeah. So, I mean, it's called cost segregation study because that's actually exactly what it is. Essentially, we go into a property like this, let's say, and we segregate different parts of the property. Uh, So the best example I have is, you know, the IRS has said you can depreciate the property over a long period of time. You and I both know, for example, carpeting does not last 39 years. Mm -hmm. So that should not be depreciated over a 39 year period. That would be a great example of something that we can reclassify into a five year period property. Mm -hmm. And then we can depreciate that a lot faster. Now there's thousands of pieces of any property that can be reclassified. A great, another great example is this paneling right here. Mm -hmm. This is considered short life property. This would go into that short life bucket like carpet. Uh, And so if we do this, uh, it could be anywhere from 25 to 40% of the property qualifies to actually be in the short life versus that long life and getting just a little bit at a time. And so to your point, bonus depreciation, once we've gone through the whole property and segregated all those little pieces that can be depreciated at a short life, then the IRS has also said that not only can you depreciate that over five years, you can actually take all that depreciation today. Yeah. And that's a huge deal too. So, you know, in contrast, like let's say that you were to just take a normal amount of depreciation. Let's say it's a million dollar property. Over the span, you said 27 and a half years, Let's say. roughly. Yeah. Yeah. And so if you're taking a little bit of that over the span of 27 and a half years, what is that, $27,000? Yeah, it, it, on a million dollar property, it ends up being something like, let's say, approximately sixteen to $20,000 a year in deductions, mm-hmm. which actually translates to somewhere between three and $5,000 in deductions. Um, and I can give you a real case study on a Airbnb property in the mountains in here in Colorado, they bought it for a million dollars. If they wouldn't have done that cost segregation study, they would have gotten about 20 ish thousand dollars in deductions. We did this study for them and they got $300,000 in deductions. So now until they make approximately 120 ish thousand dollars in income, they're going to pay $0 in taxes. And going back to your point, I mean, one of the reasons why I got into this and why I love it is because I always learned growing up, you know, the wealthy don't pay taxes. And I'm not saying you should or shouldn't pay taxes. That's not what I'm saying. What I do know, though, is when you get to a certain point, especially when you start really building your business and you're making a ton of income, your tax bracket goes up. You start paying more taxes. One of my new clients, he made $5 million last year. He's going to pay up to a million dollars plus in taxes. And we're about to do this cost segregation on a bunch of his properties. And it's basically going to cut it down to a quarter of what he would have paid. Yeah. So it's so incredibly impactful because what would you do with that million dollars? You could hire more people to either, you know, expand your business or like expand your short term rental portfolio, which in turn hires more people. Yeah. And, And by the way, this this specific strategy is especially powerful with short-term rentals. We call it the short-term rental loophole. And basically, in general, you're allowed to use the deductions. So I give I give a be- the better way to put it is uh, when you get this uh, this accelerated depreciation, you're allowed to use it against your income. But there's some caveats, and the caveats are that if you're not a real estate professional or it's not a short-term rental, then you can only use it against the income coming from the properties. Now, if you have 10,000 properties and that's your main source of income, that's great. For most of us, though, that maybe only own you know one, two, three short-term re- rental properties, that's not going to be as useful. The short-term rental tax loophole is that you don't need to be a real estate professional to get that full benefit and use it against your personal W-2 income as long as you're the one that's uh, managing the property. 
uh, even if you're not a real estate professional by nature, you can take that uh, deduction against your personal W-2 income. And that's one of the major reasons why people are uh, focusing on short-term rentals and doing this specific strategy with short-term rentals. Yeah, because if you were to do long-term rental, like back to what we were talking about, sure, you can take a little bit of depreciation every year, in your right. example, around 20000 right a year. But that's not like a tax credit. Like that's a $20,000 write-off mm-hmm. in comparison to something that could be a $200,000 exactly. write-off. Yeah. And so if you're taxed at, you know, 30%, 35%, a $20,000 write-off is only going to be like $6,000. Something like that. Yeah. In tax savings. Right. Whereas a $200,000 write-off could be $60,000. Or more. Or more yeah. in tax savings. Absolutely. So, I mean, that's where it really comes to be so impactful. So, okay, there's a lot of moving parts here. So we're talking about, you know, lowering tax liability through bonus depreciation in order to qualify for it you have to materially participate right and you have to have a cost segregation study conducted correct that's where you come in yes how does one conduct a cost segregation study and can it be done retroactively that's a great question so uh, in in terms of the process of it, it's it's pretty simple. It's just labor intensive. Essentially, uh, what we do or or anybody that does this generally does is we get some information up front. It's usually the address of the property, what you paid for the property, when you actually placed it in the service, aka started renting it out, um, and then a couple other small pieces of information. From there, we kind of do an analysis, f- uh, find out what we can get you versus what the cost of the project is. And then assuming that it makes sense to move forward from there, then basically we go, uh, we go visit the property. Um, we take measurements, we take videos and we, uh, uh, measure, well, I said measurements, videos, and pictures basically make sure that we have everything fully uh, documented. And then from there we go back and we use our calculators and our software to, uh, build out a report that basically, uh, substantiates everything and records everything so that when we finally finish and have our deliverable to hand off to our clients, they can hand that to their CPA or they can use that to file. And it's fully substantiated. There's nothing in there that uh, doesn't have some sort of a reference to it. So, you know, in the case that the IRS ever did come knocking, there's nothing to ask about because they could just look at it and go, okay, that's there. That's there. We see that you guys got everything. And that's really the, the you know, our side of things to make sure that we get everything, uh, make sure that you guys get the most benefit and decrease the liability from the IRS by making sure that everything's fully substantiated. That makes sense. So I've actually, I've had a study done and I was shocked at how detailed it was. Yeah, they get really detailed. It was like shower rods mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. like my carpet and like the the cabinets and like yep. a- everything that was like an interior component was recorded in this like really long report. Sometimes people will ask me, can I do this on my own? Like if I were yeah. to go online and like do like a DIY study, can I do it? What is your thought on that? So yeah, there are definitely some DIY options out there. I mean, you can do it. You're not going to get the full benefit by doing that. Um, you know, in the more DIY options, number one, uh, you're going to miss a lot of stuff uh, that somebody that's an expert in this field would know. So you're not going to get the full benefit of it. Uh, And number two, there's a lot of things that might be misidentified or mislabeled because you just don't know the codes and how all those work together. So while in certain options, especially if it's like a very, very uh, low cost property, like let's say under, under a hundred thousand dollars, that might be a great option to do one of those DIY situations. Um, but if it is a more expensive property, you don't want to do that because you're going to leave a lot of money on the table and you could potentially do it wrong, which opens you up to liability with the IRS. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not someone who's a DIY person by, by trade, and this is definitely not one. After seeing the report, like you have to be extremely detail oriented and come up with cost for so many different like little items. For sure. It, it really is intensive. Um, how much does this report cost? I mean, it's definitely going to depend on the project. Um, they can go anywhere from twenty five hundred dollars all the way up to you know 
50,000 plus, depending on the complexity of the project, depending on the size of the property. Um, so for example, you know, on a, on a residential, uh, short-term rental that you pay a million dollars for, you're probably looking somewhere in that five to $8,000 range. If you have, you know, a stadium, for example, that's definitely going to be up closer to that 30, 50 plus thousand range, depending on, you know, circumstances, logistics, size, complexity. Mm -hmm. And we did mention not everybody can do this. So let's talk about like some camps that people could fall into. Let's say that you're not a real estate professional and you only own long-term rentals. Do you suggest doing the study? You can still do it. And depending on the situation, yes, you should. Um, you won't be able to, in that specific situation, you may not necessarily be able to write it off against your personal income, but you'll get to use those deductions against the income coming from the properties. And if it's big enough, you know, that could be a big chunk of your income and that could save you a lot of your taxes. So I personally say if it's an income producing property, uh, that you bought within the past 10 years, it's worth having the conversation uh, and we'll be the ones to tell you if it actually qualifies for the study and if it's actually worth it to do it, you'll, if you'll get your ROI, for example. Um, but it's definitely worth having that conversation. Okay. And then let's say that I purchased a property years ago and I've been operating it as a short-term rental, but I just had no idea that this existed. Could I go back and do this? How does that work? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you're entitled to the depreciation on your property if you own it. Um, so if, you know, I have a perfect example. We have a client that bought a property in 2018 for about two and a half million dollars. Uh, and they didn't know that this existed until now. Uh, we are going to go and we're going to do the study now and they're going to get, they may have already depreciated a little bit of it. So there's going to be a little bit less in that pie to take advantage of. But most of it is still there to take advantage of. So he's going to end up on that specific property getting four or $500,000 in deductions. That's crazy. So that's that, that was actually my story. Like I went back after right. learning about this and did the study on properties that I had previously purchased. And then it was pretty cool because I was able to work with my CPA to amend my tax return. Yeah at a date that I, I had like a huge tax liability. And so I was able to get a refund there you go. based yep. off of doing that study. And so like working with someone like you, working with a tax professional that can like look at your situation holistically, they can apply this study where it's best utilized. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And, you know, on the point of retroactively, even if you sold a property. What? Yeah. Even if you sold the property, you can do it if it was in this current year. So if you sold a property five years ago, you can't take advantage of that. But if it's 2024 and you haven't paid your 2024 20, taxes yet, but you sold a property that was income reducing earlier in this year, you can still get the full uh, benefits of a cost segregation on that property. That is something new for me. I did not know that. How cool. Um, and then there's some changes that are happening on like how much of the benefit you can take. So it's been less and less every year. We're in 2024 at the time of this recording. What is it at this year? Yeah. So what we're talking about specifically is bonus depreciation. So no matter what the bonus depreciation rate is, you can still do a cost segregation study. Um, the bonus depreciation rate does fluctuate right now. It's at 60% as of 2024. What that means, like I had said before, is once we get all of those uh, short-term property pieces bundled into that bucket of short-term property, you're allowed to take 60% of that up front right now. As it's slated right now, it's currently going to be 40% next year in 2025, and it's theoretically going to phase, phase out over the next couple of years. With that being said, there's currently a... Uh, a bill in Congress, uh, it passed the House or it passed the Senate and we're either we're past Senate or the House. We're waiting for the other to sign off on it, which would bring it back to 100% bonus depreciation from 2023. We do expect that to go through. Um, so we're just waiting on that. But yeah, right now, as we speak, we're at 20 uh, 60%. 
Got it. Yeah. So for those who are following, like, let's say that you had a million dollar property, you were able to claim $200,000 in depreciation, you could take 60% of that against your ordinary earned income. So it'd be 120,000. And if you earned 100,000, and you had a loss of 120,000, your tax liability is zero. Now, a lot of people might ask, like, well, what happens if, you know, I took a loss that's bigger than what my actual income was? What happens to that loss? Um, So you mean from a cost segregation? Yeah. So let's say that, you know, I got $120,000 in, you know, deduction, and I only made $100,000 and I lost 120, does that carry over That's into a great question. Yeah. the next? So any of those, uh, any of that depreciation that you get from a cost segregation study, that's yours to use as you please over a 20 year period. So it lasts up to 20 years. So in the case that you're uh, providing, which is frankly the ideal case, we've literally forced that person to a net operating loss where on paper they've lost money. Uh, and so therefore they would use a hundred, a hundred thousand dollars worth of those deductions this year, pay zero taxes. And then next year they would have another $20,000 worth of deductions that they can use, or they can wait for the year after that's completely up to them and their CPA on how they want to tag team that and how they want to utilize that. Um, but yeah, but the goal is ideally you'd be using the money you save to buy another property, do another cost segregation and continue to keep yourself on paper in a net operating loss and on paper, not making any money. Mm -hmm. And I've had a lot of people be concerned about, well, if I'm always operating in a loss, how do I qualify for another property? That's a great question. And I've gotten that question quite a bit too. (laughs) The good news is it doesn't affect it. The underwriters are not going to look at that. Uh, As a matter of fact, I've actually heard in some cases where it actually helps you uh, qualify because sometimes they do look at depreciation, especially on larger uh, commercial properties. And so it looks like it's going to cash flow even more potentially. So sometimes that actually makes it a more desirable property for the lender, but it certainly doesn't negatively affect it in any way, shape, or form in any case. Yeah. So I actually had this because, you know, when you're a real estate investor and constantly purchasing properties, I was so concerned that, you know, if I, it looked like I had a huge loss on my tax returns that I wasn't going to be able to qualify. But the coolest thing is, like you said, that underwriters will actually add that line item back, which is unique because when I claim other losses as a business owner, a lot of times they won't add that back. And it does hurt my ability to qualify. But this like is just kind of the gift that keeps giving. Yeah. Like, they just add it right back. Like we said, you know, real estate's that triple threat. It's got the tax advantages of depreciation. It's got the capital gains and the cash flow. Very few asset classes have that ability. Uh, so, I mean, that's why I love real estate. I'm sure that's part of the reason you love real estate and all your clients do as well. So let's say that, you know, they, someone like did the study, they took all the loss from that property. You don't get to continue to take loss from the property going forward, correct? So, so yes and no. Uh, yes, from the perspective of there's still going to be some straight line appreciation left because there's still the long life property, for example, the roofing and the uh, foundation. So that's still going to depreciate over the long term. Um, but you can only do it once on a property with the exception of if you do major renovations, you can do a cost segregation again because you can take uh, depreciation against those renovations. Renovations in general are very high reclass when it comes to tax purposes. Uh, so, you know, if you've owned a property, let's say for five years, you did your cost segregation study, you've gotten your depreciation, and then you go and put $500,000 into that property. We'll do a depreciation analysis on the uh, renovations you've done, and you can get even more benefit from that. So on the property itself, it is a one-time uh, situation, but if you end up doing uh, renovations or adding on or building a new property or building a new building on the property, you can do it again for that. That's really cool. Um, now let's talk about like some of the complications with doing this. So let's say that you know I did the cost segregation study, I took the bonus depreciation, mm-hmm. I'm living my best life, I'm not paying taxes, but now I want to sell that property. Mm. Do I have to pay it back? So. No, you don't have to pay it back. Um, What there could potentially be is something called depreciation recapture. That's not paying it back. Uh, What that is, is that uh, 
if I remember correctly, exactly the way it works is that your long-term capital gains on that property uh, would go to, would turn into regular income. So the tax rate on that would go up a little bit. However, we found that the benefit of doing it still significantly outweighs whatever, uh, whatever, uh, sort of, uh, penalty there might be by doing that. Mm -hmm. I've heard that. And then I've also heard that, you know, I had a CPA on here mm -hmm. and he said, defer, 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 die is like his like methodology. And what he said is you could actually roll it into a 1031 exchange. You can do that. Absolutely. So like from, and correct me if I'm wrong, but from my understanding, it's you would 1031 exchange mm -hmm. into a new property. Let's say that, you know, I had a million dollar property and then I'm 1031 exchanging into a 1.5. Yep. That would just follow over into the new property. And so I couldn't do a cost segregation study on that new property up to the, you know, million dollar mark, but I could on the excess. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you clearly know your stuff, which is awesome. Okay, good. Um, yeah. So yeah, you can definitely do that. You can 1031 a property and then do a cost segregation. As you stated, um, the basis of a million dollars from the old property that you won't be able to do it on. Um, but on that extra half a million, you can, like you got said. it now. And, and we actually have a lot of clients that they'll do a cost segregation. They'll 1031 the property, they'll buy a new property and they'll do that 1031 on the new basis of, you know, mm -hmm. cause it's a bigger property. They did renovations. So it, as a matter of fact, if you do a cost segregation, uh, on a property and 1031 it, if I remember correctly, you're actually required to do a, a cost segregation on the next property because it's they, they want like kind for like kind. That's kind of what they're looking for, the consistency there. That makes sense. And then as far as like a process standpoint, so let's say that like, I'm really excited about this and I need to do a cost segregation study immediately and try to get you know money back from my taxes. How long does it take? Yeah, so uh, to do the... Uh, initial analysis probably takes one to two days. Uh, then we do our intake meeting. And then from there, we do our site visit. We like to say from the time of the site visit until you get the actual deliverable, you're looking at a timeline of somewhere between four and six weeks. Um, sometimes it could be a little bit less, but that's kind of that sweet spot. Cool. So I would get the study back and then I would give that to my CPA. And then it's kind of up to the CPA to amend returns or apply it. And at that point, I'm working with my CPA to get that refund or... Correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, just so you know... Any, any legitimate cost segregation firm, they should be working in tandem with the CPA throughout that process to make sure that everything looks good, to make sure that they're filing it the right way and that things get done the proper way so that when it actually does get filed, uh, everything looks sound and clean to the IRS or whoever's getting that. Um, but yes, you're, you, the CPA is going to be the one in general to do it. Or if you're doing your taxes yourself, you can also use it and do it yourself. Hmm. Again, I'm not a DIY person. I would yeah, never try I don't to do that, but. that. Especially if you know you're starting to get into the world of owning properties and mm -hmm. you know the rentals and such. Taxes start to get a bit more complex. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Cool. So let's say someone wants to get in touch with you to conduct the cost segregation study. How do people find you? Yeah. Well, there's Centive.tax. That's our website. Um, we're on LinkedIn. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. Uh, you know, you can get in touch with me, yaron.pact at centive.tax. Uh, on our website, there's a free uh, estimate. Uh, basically, you can input all your information into that, and then we'll get back to you within 48 hours with an estimate. You can call us also, 720-755-1112. Awesome. And we'll include this all in the show notes. Thank Amazing. you so much for sharing with yeah. us today. We thank really you. appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. You bet.